insecticide, Bt. And I'll talk about this a lot. But before I start, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm an agroecologist by training and have been working in the field, well, I kind of got into this through doing my PhD in the United States in 1990, beginning to work on biocontrol issues and compatibility of biocontrol uh, carried out uh, and the compatibility with BT biological pesticides when it was sprayed as a sprayable form. And it was the days, the heydays basically, of when they tried to introduce the GM technology into agriculture, and I did my PhD in what is called the Research Triangle of the United States, that's in North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill area, and this is where all of these chemical companies and the biotech companies in those days, and still today, and so I believe, have their research labs and were developing these technologies and the packages of the technologies. So we had a lot of interaction, the people from these research institutions, from the companies came and went a lot uh, to our university, the North Carolina State University, and so I got a lot into thinking and hearing and listening to all of the promises and the visions that these uh, scientists of the companies in those days developed. And this, because it was BT was my research as a spray and they were putting it now into plants, Naturally, I was kind of interested to sort of verifying or back-checking or understanding what they were doing there and began then to extend my research into including transgenic plants that express the BT. So we're calling this a stock-taking exercise because it was, it's 25 years, if not more, 26 now, that these crops have been promoted and developed and it is high time for us to take stock of what they have delivered. As I said, I lived in the United States through this period, heard it myself from the developers, from the corporations, from the scientists involved, the visions that they had in those days, and virtually nothing of that came true. What I heard in the early 90s at NC State as a PhD student was that we would be out of BT and herbicide resistance by the year 2000 that in about five year increments, we would be taking leaps in the development and that from the year 2000 onwards, we would be into custom tailored plants that farmers could basically choose what kind of combinations of traits they wanted to have them entail. It's just too bad that in those days, internet and all those recording devices that we see here today didn't exist because you could hold them now very nicely accountable and say, well, listen, you know, I heard you say 1990 at your talk at NC State that you would be going in five years steps and leaps forward and you would be producing custom tailored plant by the year 2000. And BT and herbicide resistance would just be a background noise. They would just be around and different folks. They wouldn't even be making money with it anymore because all of them would contain it anyway. There wouldn't be any difference anymore. That's what I heard. I can only serve as a first-hand witness of these days. I still know who made these statements, but um, there's very little recording, unfortunately. Nevertheless, we have to take stock, and nevertheless, we have to come back and see what came of these promises, what happened of it, and all we know is to today, we're still stuck. We never left the first day, really. It was 1990 when I started, the talk was about herbicide resistance and BT, and the year 2016, it is still BT and herbicide resistance that make up 99%, almost all, of the commercially available transgenic plants. So that's pretty, that in my view calls for a, for a serious stock-taking exercise. Now coming to BT as a bacillus stringensis, BT stands for bacillus stringensis, it is, you see this lovely organism here in the picture, it's the mother cell as it naturally occurs in the field and it contains during its, uh, in its bacterial, in the cell, it has so-called paraspole inclusion bodies um, that are deposited in a crystal shape and these are the Bt toxins deposited in that cell in this in this inactive crystal stage so they can survive in the soil a long period of time before an insect comes along, picks it up, and then uh, a process of activation will take place. 
So scientists have discovered this very early, that pesticide, uh, that, that uh, Bacillus has been co-discovered basically in Japan and in Germany. Um, Mr. Bernina was the first or the second got to name it. Unfortunately, he calls it Bacillus thuringiensis. I guess he was quicker in publishing it or whatever. But they discovered very quickly also that there is a potential use with this, that if you start formulating it, you could start killing certain types of pest insects. And it was the immature life stages of these pest insects. And so by mid last century, they began to market the first formulated Bt-based pesticides. And some of them are still out there, basically, in that form, Dipel, or Delphin, it's called in our region, um, is one of those very old, long-standing um, biopesticides that are also approved for use in organic agriculture, by the way. But it comes, the BT pesticides always came with a number of shortages and limitations, which made it actually compatible with the ecology, but it was incompatible with the industrial model of it. And that was that it was fairly unstable in the environment, it degrades fairly quickly uh, under UV light. Any rain washes it off. It only affects best the smallest immature life stages of an insect, meaning a farmer has only a very small window of opportunity to get the substance out sprayed, um, or he will have to repeat the, the treatment or it will be ineffective. So the young stages at the right time need to be hit. And everybody who knows a bit about farming knows that this limitates a lot of what farmers can do. If it rains in that time, you can't go out. If a tornado goes through your field or if something happens to your field, it's a lot of sunshine, you need to really hit it at that time. So these limitations, they wanted to overcome. The bioengineers thought they, they identified the gene that is uh, um, responsible for producing that insecticidal toxin. And I felt if we put this into a plant and get the plant to express the Bt toxin itself now, it will overcome these limitations. It will be out there for a longer time, be available for any uh, insect whenever it hatches from an egg mass and has the right life stage, it will, it will eat or meet, meet that uh, pesticide and it will not be so easily degradable out there. So it would overcome it, sounds reasonable, so that's what they uh, worked out and did. BT, the transgene for the BT pesticide is included today mainly in maize and in cotton. Soybean, for some reason, was difficult to get the transgene in, but now there is also a BT soybean on the market since a number of years uh, in combination with the herbicide resistance. And there is no BT canola out there yet. So what they did, the idea was straightforward, they put the transgene in there, get the plant to produce the toxin, any insect that comes by that is susceptible, feeds on it a little bit, gets a belly ache and dies, and the crop is protected. So that was the idea, and off the curve went. This is the production curve. Um, you saw from 1996, it was released the first time in the United States, and there, those adoption rates um, seem to be um, confirming the expectations and the predictions of the producers that it is really popular. So by the year 2003, uh, this was one book, there were other um, articles published, where BT was called a cornerstone of modern agriculture. And modern agriculture, of course, meaning industrial agriculture, which is not what I consider modern agriculture, but it was clear so that you understand what they mean with that. Um, and we were going to question. So what we have now was a difference, as I said before, is it's out there 24 seven, meaning all the time. It was intended to be out there in high doses for resistance management purposes all the time. And it was put in the plant in its activated form. I will get to the mode of action, which is quite complicated for PT in a moment and explain you the difference. So that it's in, and it's in all parts of the plant now, from kernel to pith, to stem, to leaves, to the tassel and the pollen. We could, through the genetic engineering, we could produce toxic pollen now, which is a, in my view as an ecologist, that is a fundamental game changer if you make pollen toxic. So, 
Gone were the days with that, automatically, silently, the idea of IPM that I was still raised in when I studied insect control and pest management. In the 80s, there was a lot of talk about IPM. IPM meaning integrated pest management, which had a set of rules, meaning you wouldn't just precautionarily apply pesticides and spray based on the calendar, which was the practice in those days, but you would actually wait and see if a pest manage management problem would manifest itself, and you would go and scout, and you would follow the population, and you would only treat if and when you had a problem that was exceeding a certain threshold, an economic threshold, for example. Well, that's not possible anymore. If you have a pesticide expressed in a plant 24-7 all the time at high concentrations, no threshold anymore. No monitoring, no scouting, no IPM. Now, this meant, of course, that there is a vast expansion of the spatiotemporal exposure. And from that comes that many more organisms out there are now going to be exposed <coughs> continuously, all the time, to the activated toxin of the Bacillus thuringiensis than you were with sprays. So, a fundamental difference to what you had with sprays. Sprays were inactive and they were there, if you're lucky, for a few days, sometimes hours. Which means now you have a lot more non-target organisms out there in the field that will also be exposed, will be eating it, or will be passing it on in the food chain that nobody had ever even thought about with the use of BT sprays because it was gone so quickly. So that made at least myself and a few, I must say, colleagues think, what do we actually know about the mode of action of this toxin? And what do we know about the range of organisms that are affected by it to that date, talking mid-90s? Well, what we did find was a lot of sweeping claims in the 90s to this very day about resting entirely on a constructed narrative about the specificity of this product of Bt toxins and deriving from the specificity that it can only affect certain types of insect pests derive that it must be safe. Now, this, these are some of the statements you will find all the time. Even for transgenic plants, you would find that narrative that, was de that came and was derived from the use of Bt formulations, which differed in a number of fundamental aspects from what there was in the plants. To this day, this is just what I downloaded a couple weeks ago from the internet. In every dossier you find that is submitted to any regulator in the world, you will find statements like this, where they justify that they don't need to look into any broader issues of Bt toxins affecting other kinds of organisms, because the Bt formulation has been proven to be safe for so many decades. Now, let's go and see where that narrative comes from. So, what did they know, or what did they actually do with BT sprays on which they now base the assumption for transgenic plants? Well, what you find, and there's a few colleagues, but at least some, go and look into what was known about the activity and the specificity of BT toxins in insects and on what basis this rests. So a review published by a colleague, Dr. Van Frankenhausen, in 2013, found out that he found 148 studies that were actually looking into the mode of action and found that 83% of these were of these pesticide and proteins of Bt were only tested on organisms from one or two orders of insects. And furthermore, these from these one or two orders of insects, it was only tested on herbivorous, on, a, on an even smaller subset of organisms. You had to be herbivorous, they had to be making its way on the radar of, for farmers being pests, meaning they have been exceeding an economic threshold and therefore farmers take notice of it. And that reduces it from to one or two orders of pest insects to basically one, which is the Lepidopteran order. And it's herbivorous pests of Lepidopteran orders where the vast majority has been done. And from that, it was extrapolated with the application of transgenic plants to all insects.
Okay? So that kind of a jump and quantum leap and extension of based on what's been done on a very small number of a very particular subset of insects applied to all of the insects. Now what do we know about the mode of action and what was known about Bacillus stringensis as microbial as the bacteria? Well, when I started out to work with BT in 1990, it was pretty straightforward. This was the model called now the classic pore model, pore formation model. And it went as, let me see, we can get it. This is the inactive crystal. The crystal has been taken up, had to be ingested. It's a, it's a gut poison, has to be ingested by a insect. And in order for the insect to be susceptible, it had to have the right combination of certain enzymes in its gut so that it could dissolve, for one, the crystal. That requires a very high pH of 10, 11, and 12. Only a few insects have that. Then you had a still inactive protoxin that continues, needs to continuously be degraded by gut enzymes into becoming what we call a toxic fragment, or what commonly is being addressed to called the toxin. Okay? One needs to understand that toxin is the product of a degradation process of the whole bacterial protein. Now that toxin has to be, or is known to need to bind to certain receptors in the gut of an insect, and that receptor-bound toxin then induces through complex change of molecular changes in the, in the epithelium, it causes punches holes in your guts, in essence. It's called pore formation. And through that, um, bacteria from the gut can leak into the hemocele, start uh, cause septicemia, and the insect dies of it. So this takes days to happen. Even in a susceptible insect, it's about two days or longer before they can die, before they die of it. Now, today, we have different models. We have additional models now being proposed. One being the sequential binding model. Okay, here still you have crystals need to be solubilized, protoxins, etc. But it comes an additional binding, receptor binding step to it that is, according to this model, is required before then that old kind of receptor bound toxin kicks in and the pore formation uh, results from it. So you have another binding step here that needs to be uh, going through. We have yet another one coming up in all like 10 years ago when scientists started to look. That's called the tr signal transduction model. And according to that model, um, punching holes is not even in the screen anymore. It's not even in the picture anymore. It can kill an insect entirely without punching holes in the gut just by what is called a, a cell death process that is being induced. So you still need to be binding. The toxin still binds to a, to a receptor in the mid-gut epithelium. But from then on, it is kind of a cell death process where it's fairly complicated, we don't go into, that then causes the insect to die. So we have a whole range of possibilities how insects can die from the toxin, obviously. And we have suggestions, these are some of the, the people, it's always research groups who work on these individual models, and we have one research group that is now suggesting that really it is a combination of the two. You need a sequential binding and a signal transduction model that can cause uh, kill insects, all right? And you have, meanwhile, people who think this is all rubbish. Uh, there was a, a very meticulous critical review published a number of years ago where they looked at the data that is based, all of these um, models are based on and are taking them apart. These are people, uh, colleagues who are working in this field since decades, longer than I'm working in the field, definitely. They had, uh, are definitely qualified to look into all the data, and their conclusion was pretty damning. They said that neither model is really well supported by the data they're, they're putting forward, that none of them, many uh, important questions remain just as poorly understood as they were before these models were put forward, and ultimately they postulate that the good old classical model of pore formation that I grew up with, basically, I was introducing 
19, the early 90s, still for them con continues to be the most valid model with the most substantiated databases that is in its support than before. So this is all with the microbial pesticide, okay? Where so there's various ways it can kill insects apparently. But in plants, as I told you, we don't deal with the full protein. We deal, we have no crystals there, meaning the whole crystallization or crystal dissolving pro process, the protoxin solubilization process of chopping that protoxin in, in little pieces until it becomes a toxin is cut out, meaning that was a critical part that would determine what kind of insect would be dying of it. If you didn't have the right gut enzyme, if you didn't have the right gut pH, like 10, 11, or 12, which is non-trivial, um, that couldn't do anything to you. But who knows if you get the toxin, whether or not you have the right receptors, because the receptors that have been proposed are not that uncommon. They are not that highly specific. Many insects have similar versions of it, and from what we see, there is very different variability in how we can affect insects. So this process is out. All we have to deal with is the toxin, the activated toxin in the plants all the time. Plus, we also find that all transgenic plants expressing the Bt toxin have even smaller parts of it in the plant as well. This is just one where they uh, show in the, in the gels that you have significant cleavage of products that are unknown but of lower molecular weight than the original the 65 or 70 kilo Dalton size toxin. They are observed in cotton and corn and nobody knows whether they're active or not. You can detect them using the same ELISA methods, but we have never known whether they change the range of susceptible, whether other insects are susceptible to it, or whether they increase the efficacy. Unknown. If you think that's complicated so far, now it gets even more complicated with the more. <laughs> because what researchers also about 10 years ago found out in 26 is if you give, if you treat the insects before you give them the BT a formulation, if you treat them with antibiotics, and here we connect to what um, Professor Heinemann was telling before. If you treat the guts with antibiotics and clear out the bacteria in the guts before, and you give them then the BT, they don't die. They're happy. They survive. So this started a whole other dispute in the science world, made it into PNAS, made it into the media. BT toxin isn't actually the killer. But what is killing then the insects in the presence of the bacteria? Well, there is, I can't go into all the detail of the argument there. The reason is what these uh, scientists have been uh, putting forward is that the BT is only there to punch holes. But if there is no bacteria in the gut that could then seep into the hemolymph and actually kill it, they wouldn't die. It was actually the commensal bacteria in the gut that got out of place and then turned into a pathogen in the hemocell that killed it. Needless to say, there's a whole other fraction of scientists who are out and say this is rubbish, not true. You were killing with your residual activity of the antibiotics, you were treating the insects with, you still killed the bacillus, etc. So that's why the bacillus wasn't killing the insects. Unresolved to this very day. But we do have a few studies that have repeated this model. And some of them find, confirm what Broderick et al. and the people have been finding who suggest that BT is not the killer. But you also found others where you had an increase in mortality when you treated them with antibiotics. So nobody can quite make total sense of this and understands. And I'm suspecting that there is very intricate relationships between gut microbiome and external foods. And now we ought to be looking into what glyphosate as an antibacterial substance that is also in many of the diets that these insects get might interfere with it unknowingly. We don't even know what we're looking at. So my conclusion from that is mode of action of BT was always and remains poorly understood. We have by no means the full control over it and understand how it works in insects. We seem to know in fact less today about the mode of action than we used to know when I started 30 years ago. There was one model and that's, that was like this is it. And now we're all confused since I, there are so many other out there. 
but we choose deliberately to stay uncertain, to maintain this uncertainty, because you would think with all of these controversial data out there and input and new models out there, some people would start finally looking into what it does in other organisms that you don't call pests and you don't call herbivore. No, it is not. The mantra is still, it's safe, therefore we don't need to look. Now, what types of effects have been looking for? Well, that was the next step we were asking. What they were always looking for, because it was a pest control issue, for quick kill, under strictly economic definition, per, uh, criteria. It had to be short term, it had to stop the insect from feeding on, the, on your precious parts of the plant, and it had, meaning it had to be acutely toxic to the insect, right? That was the definition of a biological effect, of a quick kill is what I call it. Now, when you, that made sense when you were dealing with a microbial pesticide, which is out there only for a few days and will lose its efficacy, but it didn't make sense anymore when you were putting it in a plant 24-7 and it was there all the time. Right? Because then you started to think about or also long-term effects came on the agenda. Because now you had, had to look or should be looking into long-term and chronic works also at the sublethal level that might not kill but just chronically, but just chronically uh, make the insect sick, less fertile, less fit and less fit for the survival or for competition. Now some of us, despite the narrative, despite the mantra that was put out there, despite all this encouragement for any of us entomologists to look into non-target effects of Bt toxins, we were trying to stop to do that work with every means possible. Some of us did, nevertheless. And this is just, it's a list, it's not comp uh, comprehensive, but it's just to show you the different types of effects when you start looking for longer term effects, you can find. Yes, there was mortality issues, but over a generation of time period, way more than any toxic study that lasts maximum for five or six days could find. There were behavioral differences. There was difference in adult emergence, for example, in development, in growth, in reproduction, in enzyme activity, in weight, sexual maturation, egg production, community composition, etc. This is what these people found, all with non-target insects, with insects that are beneficial and useful to the environment, not, not the usual pests. These are ours, just to say we were, that was my, my part of in the research in there for declaration purposes, but also others looked into this and all of these were what we would call slow kill effects that you would not pick up by just looking at three, five, or five days uh, using the, the protoxin and the microbial pesticide in it, even if you would take the toxin, the activated toxin. Now, the cross, I will skip that. My conclusion from now, mode of action, we don't know much, and Bt toxins don't seem to be so specific when you extend the exposure time and when you expand the range of organisms you're looking into. Only under a very narrow, the narrowmost specificity narrative, which is exclusively based on economic parameters for pest control purposes, you might claim a certain specificity, but for environmental purposes, for environmental risk assessment and understanding what is going on if that ends up outside of your agricultural field, this is a far too narrow definition. And if you have a broader definition and look into broader issues, you do start seeing problems. All of these problems then that arise from having a persistent insecticide and bioactive substance out there in high amounts for all the time are then actually fairly predictable. So none of this was any mysterious, any one-on-one -on -one introduction into insect ecology would tell you the kinds of effects you would then expect, right? We know from the economic entomology literature, from the pest control literature, we know a lot about secondary effects, for example, secondary pests that replace the main pest. The main pest is often a main pest because it's there in high densities, 
So if you take it out of the system, others will move in and replace that. So you have pest replacement processes, basic entomology 101 processes, adverse effects if you have a potent bioactive toxin that is passed on in the food chain from the prey up to the predators, you can see adverse effects in beneficial insects, predators, parasitoids, etc. All of this would have been straightforward ecological thinking, or was straightforward ecological thinking, that we did, and that is why we looked into these things. They were, needless to say, ignored. And this is a little case example I'd like to explain to you with, and with that I will finish then. This is the Western bean cutworm example. That is a pest, a Lepidopterus pest, out there in the United States, in the corn growing bed, that actually was fairly unknown. It hadn't even made it on the radar of being a pest in most of the areas in the, in the Midwest. In some marginal lands, it occasionally occurred, so some farmers had a name for it, others didn't even know what it is. So the Western bean cut one, there were in, 20, in 2006, there was a, a, a research group who published their work and raised the alarm and said, this Western bean cut one is an emerging or potential pest of transgenic Bt corn because it only apparently occurred on Bt corn. It wasn't a, a, a pest and wasn't recognized on the conventional non-Bt corn, but it made its way up on the scale as a pest on Bt corn. So when they said results from the study underscore the need to investigate other emerging or potential other pests on transgenic corn, because a whole different set of organisms might become pests on Bt corn than on the normal corn. Now, Greenpeace took to action, <coughs> charged uh, and, and to task uh, Dr. Tin, who was going to be here but couldn't come, to write a report about this for Greenpeace. And they launched this report in 2010 and claimed that a dramatic, and by then it got worse and worse, I must say, a dramatic range expansion of the Western bean carbon was due entirely to a phenomenon that we know well, the pest replacement that resulted from the adoption of genetically engineered Bt plants. All right, so that was Greenpeace. That triggered a group of researchers that are closely aligned to the industries to go and formulate a counter statement and get this published. I'm always glad when people publish these things so you can actually then um, just deconstruct them and, and reveal the thinking behind it. They published a counter paper explicitly as a response to this Greenpeace Germany report launched a year before and said we maintain that the scientific literature does not provide empirical field collected data to support the finding that Bt corn is the sole factor that influenced the range expansion. They propose that a broader ecological and economic factors are to explain why the Western bean cutworm has expanded this range. Listen, listen. The broader ecological framework is what we have been claiming and demanding by that time since, what, 1990 when the whole thing came up? when we said you've got to be looking into broader ecological issues because if you put it out there all the time in every plant, you know, in maize and soybean and what have you, you will see problems. No. For risk assessment, that wasn't thought. That wasn't thought to be the right thing to do. But when it comes now to deflecting responsibility, when something goes wrong, then the broad ecological factors are coming on the game in order to help them say, no, 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 this is all, it's the environment, and here's what it is. They're saying, we propose, no, here, these are all the criteria. It is the production practice, conservation tillage. It is the reduced insecticide use. It is glyphosate resistant crops even that are responsible for it. It's pest replacement, yes. It's insect genetics, it's the insect pathogens, it's the soil type, it's pre-existing insect population densities, it's even climate change. They're all, that's all the reason why the Western bean cutworm has been expanding well, yes, you're probably right. But this is something that you could know. This is something we told them from the beginning that this is what will happen 
and that this is what will influence the safety and the ecological unfolding of this technology in its all beauty and breadth. And we have come up with risk assessment concepts where we included this, that you have to be looking into this, not when it pops up and is a problem, but that it is a responsibility of the developer to look into these things before they put it on the market, to understand what all those particular these, these, uh, consequences might be. We've published extensively about it. We ran case examples where we looked under a broad ecological pen to it. It was always deflected. No, not for safety purposes. We don't want to do that, no. So what happened today? What's the consequence if you don't do it, if you do a narrow safety assessment? Well, you have a problem. Yes, and the, the problem is the farmers have the problem. It's in the commercial phase, it's not in the responsibility of the developers anymore. The farmers have to be working and handling, dealing with it and see how they can work, work this out. So now it's been a set of colleagues, entomology colleagues, who have written in desperation an open letter, this is just now October 2016, not to their agencies who supposedly should have had the responsibility of making sure that these things are looked at in time. No, they went directly to the developers and said, you must please, please recognize that this one has now become from a non-target organism, from being a secondary pest, an emerging, replacing others, an emerging pest, it became now the primary pest of this of uh, maize, is not a secondary pest anymore, having a huge evolution from being inconspicuous, not a problem, to becoming a secondary pest and then becoming a primary pest. The one who has to deal and figure out how to deal with it is the farmer, not the companies, of course. And this is not the only one, there is others. Nature published a paper on these bugs are not uh, affected by uh, BT and have been replacing the ones that are affected. We now see all of these reports emerging also from countries like India and other places. Here, this is just if you Google punch in whitefly BT cotton, you get all kinds of reports. Very little in the scientific field. You have to resort to these kinds of information sources because there's, the scientists are not allowed to work on it. They're not allowed, they don't get the money to do the research to deconstruct these narratives and they are not allowed to publish it. Pakistan, I just found this the other day, just came out, say BT cotton is a tongue failure in Pakistan as it has created new bugs and insects which were never seen in the past. So what we're seeing with the Western bean cutworm is not a singular case. Resistance evolution in the target pests is skyrocketing. You can look this up. And what we start seeing now is a drop in the production. Now, I think in many of these countries we are starting to see as there is nothing new coming up, they are not necessarily producing them anymore. Cotton production in India has fallen this year by 35%. We will start seeing the same in Pakistan, as it's not working anymore. Portugal has been a number of years seeing a drop in it already. In Spain, the only country in Europe that grows one type of BT maize, um, we have headlines like this. I'm looking forward to get the confirmed <coughs> numbers by the government. This is very difficult to get the numbers out there. Burkina Faso, we might hear about this. We have. Uh, Dr. Uribe here with us, he will present it tomorrow. Burkina Faso has been getting out of it and is seeking compensation from Monsanto over a GM cotton strain that's not working anymore. Did Miss Europe something? No. We've seen that before. I can skip that and say what Professor Heinemann just has um, lectured you on has been picked up by the New York Times recently. You might or might not have seen that. Uh, article Broken Promises, where they extended the line. Remember that uh, Professor Heinemann's ended around 2010, they've extended it now to 2014 and 2015 and are confirming that the crop yields haven't been growing. So, cornerstone of modern agriculture to take stock? I don't think so. One reason why Europe hasn't lost anything out in that producing it, but these are all the countries who have a ban, but we do sell it. 
we do live on the companies in our countries that sell it elsewhere, sell it to Argentina, sell it to Brazil, and the United States, and that's something we have to deal with. Thank you.